Our speaker tonight is Ben Nelson, a professor with the uh, Arizona State University School of Human Evolution and Social Change. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm going to turn the mic over to, to Ben. Thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. And uh, yes, we used to be called anthropology, but then we got more complicated about it. Uh, I attended one of these cafes. Can you all hear me in the back OK? More volume? I, I can shout. That's about as much as I can do about the volume. <laughs> Uh, I had the pleasure of hearing Pat Gilman speak in Phoenix the other day, uh, and I'm just hoping to do half as well. Uh, I'm used to talking to people who are a little bit younger than this crowd. <laughs> so on that basis, I should be better understood than usual, since I'm with you. Uh, I have been working in Mexico uh, for many years, and my motivation for working there is to understand the matter that I want to talk to you about tonight, which is the connection or the many connections between uh, Mexico and the American Southwest. There are only certain places I can stand without getting feedback. I'm going to be burned back into my place, I think. Uh, yes, and so there, there are several different kinds of connections that existed in the past. And there's obviously the, the connection of the, the maize agriculture that came up from Mexico several thousand years ago. I'm not going to deal with that, but that is the fundamental connection that, that people here had with, with groups to the south. There are then uh, a series of different kinds of objects and symbols and, uh, and materials that move between Mexico, what's now Mexico, and what's now the US Southwest uh, over pretty impressive distances. And that is what I'm going to be talking about. There's a third kind of connection, which is some people call it teleconnection. Uh, they say that Mesoamerica and Southwest are teleconnected, meaning they seem to move together according to patterns and ways that nobody really quite understands why the developments are, are synchronous. Uh, and that interests me a great deal. But I think in order to understand that, we need to understand more material kinds of things. People have been interested in this connection for a long time. And archaeologists far uh, earlier and better than me have looked at it uh, in the 40s, in the 1940s. There was a conference called to try and pin down the nature of these connections to try and understand what they meant. Uh, and Emil Howery was part of that, a number of other people. Uh, following that, and in subsequent decades, uh, through the 70s and into the 80s, uh, people kept on sort of picking at this question. And uh, people like J. Charles Kelly uh, <clears throat> and uh, Phil Wigand, of course, Charles DePeso, and his uh, wonderful team of people that worked in Pakime all were concerned with these issues. Almost all of these people up to that point thought of these connections as probably the result of powerful political actors who somehow influenced the Southwest, who came and, and literally pushed people around in the Southwest and caused them to adopt Mesoamerican kinds of things. <clears throat> uh, Randy McGuire wrote an article in 1980. I hope some of you have read it. It's in Kiva. It's called Mesoamerican Connection. It's a very good article, even now, uh, where he said, well, wait a minute. If there were powerful political actors coming up from Mesoamerica and influencing this place, where are their colonies? Why don't we see you know, whole suites of all these Mesoamerican traits in, in, just in certain places? Uh, and he said, I think maybe we're talking about something a little more diffuse, a little more dispersed, and we need to look at this in other ways. And it may be that the people in the Southwest had something to do with it. That it wasn't just action by Mesoamerica upon people of the Southwest. So um, again, though, there's still been this idea of there being a system, a gigantic system, somehow driven by processes or people in Mesoamerica that was responsible for bringing all these things up here. Uh, and my suggestion is, has been recently to stop looking, creating unobserved systems before we do the analysis, and instead actually look at the individual markers of interaction, see what we can learn from them, and also to, to try and make the explanations go from the past forward into the present, instead of standing in the present and looking back and saying, how did we get like this? Because the effect of that is to make assumptions about systems that were the outcomes of a long series of different behaviors. Uh, and so 
Um, you'll, I think you'll see what I mean as, as I go along here a little bit. I'm going to throw out some questions right now. And I gave you a worksheet because not that I want you to work. If you'd rather relax, that's absolutely fine. But I thought you might enjoy making note of some of the information. I think we have enough information now to answer some of these questions. And this is kind of breaking down the, the question about Mesoamerican influence in the Southwest into parts and asking different things about it that we actually know how to answer at this point with the data that we have. One of them is whether this exchange, this massive exchange, and I'll get into the details of it in a minute, uh, was reciprocal. Were things being sent south for the things that came north? Uh, another one is, was there one system of interaction or were there many? Uh, and we can look at that by looking at what's moving and how it's connected to places in different parts of the big, greater Mesoamerican world. Was, was mar were market demands in Mesoamerica driving the movement of these objects? It has been said, and not very long ago, in a very good article by someone who's here, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that, that the demand for turquoise in Mesoamerica explains a lot of the movement, a lot of the acquisition that happens by Southwestern people, that things are being exchanged for Southwestern turquoise. I'm skeptical of that, uh, and I'll try to explain why. And uh, finally, I want to come to something that Randy McGuire uh, said in his, his excellent article in 1980 called The Mesoamerican Connection. He said, we need to look at the individual items and behaviors and symbols and practices and put that together as a picture. And we're going to find that Northwest Mexico is a big intermediary for all of this. That's where all the stuff is coming through. We're going to find a lot of evidence there. Well, a lot of us took that to heart. Randy, but also some of my colleagues there, uh, a couple tables from the rear, uh, <laughs> Paul and Susie Fish, uh, Pat, uh, Paul, Paul Minnis, uh, Michael Whalen, who's not here. Uh, uh, a number of us were out, fanned out in the early 80s to see if we could understand these. And I went to a, one of the more southern places called La Quemada. Uh, so I saw several of you had the South, Archaeology Southwest uh, number that we did on La Quemada. And the reason I went to La Quemada is because La Quemada is supposed to be located on the turquoise trail between the empires of Mesoamerica and the peoples of the Southwest and be one of the conduits to bring that turquoise south. Uh, and it was set up as a fortress in order to protect the route. This is what I was told as a graduate student. Uh, and I thought that sounded real interesting and that I would just go dig up all that turquoise and and see what was going on there. So uh, other people you know, uh, were interested in shell trade, uh, the site of Cerro de Trincheras, where the fishes uh, and, their, and Randy McGuire have centered some of their work uh, and their surveys to the north of there is another place uh, that hopefully was going to show us about this Mesoamerican interaction uh, at Pakime proper. Uh, and when I say Pakime, I assume I'm talking to people who know what that is. but. Is there anybody here who doesn't know Pakime? OK, I'm talking about a place in Chihuahua where there's a lot of this Mesoamerican stuff. And it's on the very edge of anything that we could call sort of roughly the American Southwest. Beyond that, we're, we're getting into Mesoamerica. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to do is go through very quickly. And this is a complicated story. And I'm boiling it down. So some of you are probably going to know things that might even contradict some of what I say, because I'm talking about the broadest patterns. But I want to go through several interaction markers. There are a bunch of these that we could talk about. I'm going to just talk about three pairs of them. Uh, I, want, I want to talk about ball courts and platform mounds. I want to talk about copper bells and macaws. And I want to talk about turquoise and cacao, or chocolate. OK, these are all items that, in one way or another, are embroiled in this this exchange or this pattern of interaction. And I want to talk about the time and space distribution. Where do we find these things in the Southwest and in Mesoamerica, very broadly speaking and quickly describing it, uh, their time space distribution, the form in which we find them in Mesoamerica, in the Southwest, and then also the practices associated with them. The point of all this being to see how homogeneous are the behaviors and the acquisitions and so forth, are these things all the same in Mesoamerica as they are in the, in the Southwest? And if not, what are the differences? 
Okay? And do they all occur in one, one broad pattern? Okay? So <clears throat> I'll be making notations on the map also. You can follow me along on your scorecard uh, and enter data that will help you uh, to answer some of these questions that I've raised. And at the end, I put the questions down at the bottom there too. So if you think of ways to address the questions, you can make note of that. Uh, so what I'm hoping is in the last few minutes of our time together, we'll be talking about you know, what you think the answers to these questions might be based on the patterns that I'm gonna to suggest to you. So, does everybody know what a ball court is? If you don't know what a ball court is, let me tell you. Okay, a ball court in, in, in uh, the American Southwest is likely to be found in the Hohokam area. And it's likely to, uh, to be found somewhere between 850 and 1050 in the Common Era, CE. Uh, in Mesoamerica, on the other hand, you can find ball courts everywhere, and they have a much wider temporal distribution, timing distribution. The earliest one that I know of is 1650 BCE. Okay? Uh, so that's many, many centuries before the ones in the Southwest. Uh, and uh, uh, they're found in central parts of very large sites, usually. Um, uh, their, their form in the Southwest, is, as many of you know, is oval. They're made of earth. The largest one is about 63 meters long. Uh, and in Mesoamerica, they're different. They're rectangular. Sometimes they're eye, they're eye shaped in plan. As you look down on them, they look like a capital I. That, that's an end zone that widens out at the end that makes that capital I. Um, take a second to figure out what happened to my microphone here. <clears throat> what did they do with these? In both cases, it's clear they played ball in these courts. Okay, and that's that's quite exciting. That's a very widespread practice. Uh, it got to the southwest relatively late. It lasted a very short time in, in archaeological time, uh, but it was a case of using the rubber ball of Mesoamerica. We know that because rubber balls have been found in the American Southwest. So we've got a difference in okay? timing. Okay, it's not, it's not as if Mesoamerican presence in this form is with the Southwestern people all the time. It's, uh, it's re relatively brief. Uh, we know of a couple hundred ball courts in the Southwest. We know of several thousand in Mesoamerica. Uh, it's a much more widespread practice there. It's not homogeneous in Mesoamerica. There are several different known varieties of the ball game there. So um, it doesn't, shouldn't bother us too much that it's not exactly the same up here in the Hohokam area. Platform mounds, uh, very interestingly, and I bet a lot of you know this already too, ball courts go out of use in the Hohokam area and what comes in but platform mounds, another Mesoamerican form of architecture. Platform mounds are structures that are built to elevate other structures up above the ground. And uh, in the Southwest, they're usually earthen, rectangular, a few meters high, uh, and they uh, do have structures on top of them. In Mesoamerica, and they date from about 1050 on up to around 1350 uh, or so. Okay, in Mesoamerica, again, the early platform mounds are about the same as the early ball courts. They start happening a little bit later. Um, actually, I was, there's an article published last week in Science by Takeshi Inomata and company. He's a professor here at the U of A, and he's arguing that the platform plaza complex in Mesoamerica doesn't begin until 1000 BC. Uh, even so, that's very much earlier than it begins in, uh, in the American Southwest, where we don't see it until 2000 years later, around, around 1050. It, and then it lasts for 1300. In, in the Southwest, it is not everywhere. Uh, we find platform mounds occurring something like this. Okay, whereas in Mexico, they occur something like this. Okay, that's the platform mound distribution. So it's very wide, but it's not everywhere. It's not all over what's now Mexico. You can see this, there's a great area here where you have no platform mounds. It's not all over the Southwest. There, you don't find them in New Mexico except in Chaco Canyon, and some people debate that too. Um, but anyway, it's a 
somewhat restricted distribution. Ball courts, um, I forgot to put on here, but ball courts are distributed like this. And then they're distributed in Mesoamerica, otherwise pretty much the same way as platform mounds. This is going to end up being something of a mess, I'm afraid. Uh, but we can keep track of a few of these things. Copper bells. Okay, there are copper bells in many parts of the American Southwest. They come in starting around 875 or 880. Uh, and uh, they come in also in Mesoamerica at exactly the same time almost, right around 880. And the form is identical. What you find in, in the U.S. Southwest is identical to some of the bells that are found in West Mexico early on. And that's where they're made. And, and the bells in Mexico are made down here in West Mexico. And they don't reach the center of Mexico until much later on, long after they've already been found all the way up through here and into uh, many parts of the Southwest. OK, something like this. Those are bells. OK. Now, one interesting thing about it, though, is not all the kinds of bells that you find in Mesoamerica, copper bells, are found. Only certain ones, a very limited selection. And also, the um, kinds of copper items that you find in Mesoamerica are not anywhere near fully replicated in the Southwest. The Southwestern people are taking a narrow selection of copper items specifically the bells. In Mesoamerica, there are, and especially in West Mexico, uh, in the centering on the Tarascan area, where they're made, uh, there, are, there are rings, there are hooks, there are tweezers, um, there are axes, and uh, I'm thinking, I'm not thinking of them all, but uh, Stuart Scott over here and Pat have excavated all the different kinds, and they can tell you more about that, because uh, they worked in, in the west coast of Mexico so, but what's interesting is materials are identical but select, okay? And also they have a little bit dis dif different distribution than the platform mounds and the ball courts. Macaws, now macaws, I'm talking about the scarlet macaw, and that's a bird that's uh, native to Veracruz and southward on the east uh, coast of Mexico. And it's a uh, brightly co colored animal, as you know, has beautiful feathers. The feathers were used in Mexico for many things ceremonial uh, and in, in the Southwest also. Uh, and they were, they were used to, uh, to make capes, headdresses, uh, and other, other such uh, things. In the Southwest, there's a very particular way that they're found, though. And I should say the dating of these. Macaws are very uncommon in the Southwest before about AD 1000. Okay? In Mesoamerica, they go back to about AD 100, but then they don't, they kind of disappear. And you don't see them very much until very much later in the, in the post-classic. Uh, and then not very much, actually. Uh, there's, there's some really strong differences in the ways in which macaws appear. <clears throat> in the Maya area, we see macaws as sculptures. We see, they're very clearly macaws but they're just stone sculptures. We don't find the birds themselves. Okay. Uh, and <clears throat> that's what's going on at, eight, at uh, 100 CE. In the American Southwest, starting at 1000 CE, we start to see a lot of these macaws, and they're buried. Many of them are buried. About 70% of them are buried as adolescents, or just post-adolescent, okay, at about 11 months. Macaws can live, scarlet macaws can live 75 years. So what's going on? This is a true sacrifice. And they're usually found, again, in the 71% of the cases, roughly. They're found buried in pits, as if, almost as if they were people. And sometimes they're buried with people. Sometimes they're buried with other macaws. Sometimes they're buried with military macaws, which are green. Scarlet macaws, obviously, have a lot of red feathers. Um, they're also found in the Southwest. They're found in a several other different ways. Sometimes you find the wing. Sometimes you find just the feathers. The feathers are found at the base of post holes. Parts of the skeleton are found on the floors of rooms as if they're being kept 
uh, for some purpose. Uh, and they're found in the fill of rooms as if they were being deposited when the rooms are closed up. So uh, there's a very big difference. The distribution of macaws, uh, it covers very much of the Southwest and very little of Mesoamerica, even though it is a Mesoamerican native. And it probably comes from down in here, all down through here. Um, so this is a little bit, a little bit strange uh, and different, very different from some of these other things. Now, uh, turquoise, a lot of you have probably seen a lot of turquoise items from the Southwest. And of course, contemporary Pueblo people make things from turquoise and it's sort of like a hallmark to us. Uh, in the Southwest, there's a lot of turquoise in some places and a few places. Snake Town, Pueblo Bonito. So these are ancestral Pueblo and Hohokam places. It's also, they're good at concentrations, you might say, if, if a lot is good, in places like the Membrace, uh, but not as abundant there as these other two places that I mentioned. The real, the real hot spots of turquoise are at Snake Town and at Pueblo Bonito. And then there's kind of a scattering of it all over many other places in the Southwest. Now, the picture that we have of turquoise from some of, the, some of my predecessors is that there's this great network of turquoise with, with turquoise flowing up, or rather flowing south into Mesoamerica to some of these great empires like Tula and Teotihuacan and Tenochtitlan in uh, central Mexico. Uh, but the fact actually is, if you read the Mesoamerican literature, is that just as in, as in the Southwest, there are just a few places that have turquoise. There are lots of sites in northern Mexico, big sites that have, don't have any turquoise at all. Uh, and La Quemada, where I went to excavate, and this is about all I'm going to be able to say about my excavations at La Quemada, but I went there looking and expecting to find big stores of turquoise and processing you know, workshops and, and, and so forth. We found 44 blue-green stones, and just in comparison, we found more than 200,000 potsherds. So, uh, that just gives you a sort of a sense of it. Not, not a very common item. And we've had those tested. Uh, uh, only seven of those are chemical turquoise. Uh, so that's not a big, great supply. But there are just to the north of La Quemada, uh, so La Quemada is up in here, at Alta Vista in Zacatecas, there's a great concentration of turquoise. Some of the other concentrations of turquoise that are pretty well known Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztecs, has a lot of turquoise. Monte Alban, uh, the large capital of the uh, Oaxacan Zapotec uh, communities, has a lot. And there's some caves, a number of caves and Mixtec sites uh, north of there that have a lot of turquoise. There's a certain amount of turquoise in the uh, sacred sinkhole or cenote at, Teno at uh, Chichen Itza. Quite a bit of, of it there. But that's, that's the turquoise distribution in Mesoamerica. Now, uh, if, you, uh, if you look at some of the literature on this, you're going to get a very different picture. But that's, I think, a, a, an accurate picture. And finally, I want to mention cacao. I think there's been a talk about cacao. Is that right? Did Patty Crown talk with you all about her finds? So you've got the real word on that. Uh, now, there's again, there's stuff being done. Chemistry applied to the archaeological remains that you know, you get different results depending on who you talk to. But what we know about cacao right now is it is a, once again, a tropical product similar in distribution to the, uh, to the macaw. And then the one place where we have a firm, you know, finding of it is, in, is here in Pueblo Bonito. So uh, one, another study, two other studies that have been reported have said that cacao, cacao is very widespread in all throughout the Southwest. And that's being worked out right now. And one can, uh, I'm not a chemist, but I'm, I'm skeptical about this uh, for reasons that are too complicated to go into right now. Uh, but it is a Mesoamerican item. And the interesting thing about cacao too, the, t the timing of it then is 1100 CE, okay? 1100 CE. Uh, it's used for much, much longer down in the Maya region. It's found on vessels. Uh, 
similar in general form to the ones in Pueblo Bonito where it's found. There's cylindrical vases or vessels. Uh, goes back to the, to the Middle Classic, so 300 to 600 CE, quite, quite, quite a bit older there. We don't know. We just haven't done the testing to find out if it's being used in between. And there seems to be a good probability that it was because the Aztecs were obtaining cacao, and in fact, they used it as money, uh, roughly speaking. So uh, we probably will fill in a picture with cacao being a lot more widespread than it is now. How common it is in the Southwest remains to be seen. But one really significant thing about cacao is that the ritual practices associated with the, with the material um, came along with the cacao. In other words, it's ground and made as a beverage and drunk in very special containers and deposits are made to commemorate things having done that, that ceremonial act. So what sort of a picture do we have now? Uh, and what do we think about these ideas about the kinds of patterns and activities and relationships that we have? Do we think that this represents a reciprocal exchange where there's roughly an even trade going on between people in the US Southwest and people to the South? Uh, do we think that there's a single network responsible for moving all these goods, et cetera? That, those are the questions that I'd like to be able to answer. And someday I feel that if, if we are able to answer all these questions, we can move on to another level of talking about some of the less visible kinds of connections. Uh, but it's going to take a lot of work. Uh, my students and I have recorded several thousand instances of these things that we call inter interaction markers. And we're not the very first people to record them, but we are the first people to look at them all at once and try to understand all the different behaviors. And so we're really departing from past practice where uh, the idea has been, oh, there's a marker of Mesoamerican interaction. So Mesoamerica, as if it were a country, is inter influencing the US Southwest as if it were a country. Uh, if, we, if we take that apart and ask questions in a different way, we may come to some different conclusions. And that's what I hope you'll help me do. And I know from having talked to groups like this group before that I'm going to get some things that are going to open my eyes. So I look forward to talking with you a little bit about this. I open the floor to questions. And we've got the first one right back here. Um, well, my interest is in the turquoise and um, the source of turquoise. Uh, I think that can be determined to some extent. And yes. so um, is the source in the, in the um, thank you, in the U.S. Southwest or, or is the source in uh, Mesoamerica? And yes. so was the trade one way or the other. I mean, I okay. think that would be a way to distinguish. Excellent question, and you're touching on one of the most important issues and the ground. If we could just repeat the question quickly. I'm sorry, the question was, where does the turquoise come from? Does it all come from the US Southwest? Does some of it come from Mesoamerica? Uh, it, can we think of it as being one kind of source area? There are established sources of turquoise all over the, well, in several places in the US Southwest in northern Arizona in, uh, and, and southern Arizona, in northern and central New Mexico, uh, and down a little ways into Sonora, there are sources that have been chemically uh, characterized and matched with artifacts and are said to be the sources of the turquoise that goes to Mesoamerica. That, that, and, and I say said to be because right now the ground is shifting underneath us and people are working on this again. All, all the work on this topic was done by one of our very esteemed colleagues and archeologists who passed away about two years ago, uh, Phil Wigan and his associate who was a geochemist, Garmin Harbottle. And they did a lot of work and it was very careful work. Uh, but the techniques they're using are what are known as bulk characterization techniques where you go and you get the source of the chemical profile of, a, of an item, and then you match it up with an archaeological specimen. You get it from a, a turquoise mine. You go and look at an archaeological specimen. You find a match. You say the turquoise is from there. The approach that's being taken now, and I can't speak very much about this, both because I'm not a geologist nor a chemist, but also the work is unpublished right now. But here in Tucson, there's some very exciting stuff going on 
by um, Alison Thibodeau and David Killick. And I, if they haven't talked with you, I hope they do, because they're doing some great new stuff characterizing turquoise. At the same time, uh, uh, there's a, a lab in Mexico City at the National University of Me Autonomous University of Mexico. And uh, the people there are doing excellent work where they're looking at turquoises with a battery of techniques, a whole battery of visual and chemical characterization techniques. And they're also going back and looking at some of the sources that we know were in Mexico. The thing about the Mexican ones is that they were all mined out, very heavily mined post, uh, so in, in, in colonial times and, and later. So we can't actually see the mining locations of pre-Hispanic time, which means we're also not getting the very turquoise that the pre-Hispanic people might have mined. And instead, we're getting something. There's Oftentimes, there's a lot of variability within a deposit. And so to, you really want to find that very vein that they were working in. We can't do that in these sources in Michoacan and in Zacatecas and so on because they've taken, <laughs> they've kept on mining for a long time afterward, and they're still taking copper out of there. But those people are finding, I'm struggling to remember the name of, and maybe somebody here remembers uh, the young man, his first name starts with an E. <laughs> that narrows it down, right? Uh, very impressive young guy has just put out a, an, again, it's unpublished right now, but it's circulating and, and it's going to be published where they, they've looked at all this and they're seeing that uh, the, the mosaic pieces in Tenochtitlan and in Monte Alban um, look like they're coming from these West Mexican sources. So if that's true, this is a long-winded answer to your question, wasn't it? Uh, but if it's true, then we can no longer say, which we have been saying for a couple, several decades now, that people in the Southwest are exchanging turquoise for conch shell trumpets and, and uh, macaws and copper bells and mirrors and things like that. They're coming out of Mexico. It's, it's, a, it's, a, new, it's a new game. So in that sense. I see a question here in the back. Hi, early in, early in your talk, you mentioned teleconnections that you uh, felt they, they showed some kind of spot, simultaneity. However, you wanted to talk about more material connections. I was just wondering if you could explain what some of these teleconnections are. Yeah, well, we do have the isolated development of very large regional centers like Chaco Canyon and Pakime in the American Southwest. And they seem to tie in with shifts, grand shifts of population centers and the existence of empires and then their collapse and so on in Mesoamerica. Um, and you know, at some point, it's kind of like all the stuff now with being done with ocean surface temperatures. You can match almost any pre-Hispanic or prehistoric phenomenon with a change in ocean surface temperatures, right? <laughs> so the same goes in a way for these teleconnections. We have to be very careful. We can go, we can say, oh, 900 to 1150, wow, that, that's Chaco Canyon. That matches the rise and fall of the capital of the Toltecs perfectly, okay? Then we go and we see, we get better dating on Pueblo Bonito and we find, wow, things are actually happening 800, early 800s. They're putting down these elite burials. You turn around and somebody in Tula has figured out that the capital of the Toltecs actually arose in 800. So these are the kinds of things that intrigue us and the things that since, you know, De Peso and even people before were saying, there's got to be something going on here. This isn't, it can't be random. But, but yet we don't understand it well enough to say particularly what it is materially. Does that help? This question is over here. The, the term ritual economy was used in the title of your talk. And one of the things I've observed over the last two years is that it seems that archaeologists believe that these trade items were most often used for ritual purposes, as opposed to being traded simply for aesthetic value or style. What is the evidence on which that conclusion is based, and how confident is the consensus in modern, modern archaeology? Yeah, that's a great question, and there's variety. And some of the stuff that you find is not, you know, ritual is a, is a difficult thing to define. Uh, you know, and there are many connotations. Um, I recommend an article by Lars Vogelin, who's a professor at the U of A. I seem to be reading a lot of U of A stuff. <laughs> but um, 
he, he, he struggles with the question of, you know, what is ritual? And some people would say, well, it has to be religious. But other people would say, well, but it can be many kinds of repetitive action that have a kind of quasi-religious character to them. And, and, they, and they bring people together and they, they cause social action to cohere around some principle. And so how do you draw the line? And in fact, I don't think you can draw the line except to say it's, re it's repeated behavior that has some significance to the people who do it. Now, I don't know what the significance of, of killing a perfectly good 11-month-old macaw is and burying it as if it were a human being. But I think, if I were to speculate, that it has to do with the end of the uh, dry season and the beginning of the wet season. And that what they're doing is making a connection with these, ver these birds which have very special properties. They have very unusual properties. Their feathers are iridescent. They're brightly colored. Uh, and they can be made to, into forms that make people look really special and really like something more than they are. And that goes also for copper. It has very special colors of property, proper, properties of color and sound, as Dorothy Hostler has pointed out. Um, an excellent book that you can look into more about copper uh, called Sounds and Colors of Power. Uh, and uh, I, I think virtually all of these turquoise, when it gets to Mesoamerica, it gets made into, and I didn't get into this, but there's a, quite a bit of difference in the way it's used there than it is in the Southwest. Southwest, it's mainly beads and pendants with a few mosaic pieces. In Mesoamerica, it's almost all these extremely fine mosaic pieces. They may be, may be 15,000 tesserae or little tiny squares adhered to some kind of a backing. And then what do they do with this? They take it to a cave and they go to the deepest recess of the cave that has a place that drops off way off down where no one can go and they throw it in there. If that's not ritual, I, I don't know, you know. Uh, and again, I think it has to do with connection with, with the underworld and with the forces that bring rain and fertility and so forth. So I, that's the kind of thinking and I could go on about the individual items. Ball courts obviously have a ritual dimension, at least in Mesoamerica. We don't know about the Southwest, but, uh, uh, and so on. But does that help? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I had a couple questions over here. Well, I, I can see the continuity in your distributions, but uh, your map also shows about 1,000 kilometers between Pacume and Kamada. Is there sort of a cultural blank spot there? Uh, less so than this looks like because there is the Chalchi. This is actually Chalchiwitas, and the Chalchiwitas region actually extends up like this. Uh, but not all the sites in the Chalchiwitas region have this concentration of turquoise. That's why I, what I was denoting here. Uh, but there is a little bit of a gap. Uh, several people have gone, Richard Brooks in the 1970s and other people subsequently have tried to find the southern end of the sort of Pakime sphere and then how that relates to the northern end of the Chalchiwita sphere. And even though there is a time when those are contemporary, there is a gap in which you find only the smallest, most plain kinds of sites with, you know, just brown pottery and a few houses. And there's, there's something in between that's not participating in the elaboration of material culture in the same way. Questions here? Um, with turquoise and some of the other blue stones, you know, the um, azurite, malachite, chrysocolla, malachite greener, they're not real stable in, in general. They're very soft stones. Getting a, you know, the percentage of stable turquoises is, is actually very small. And especially with so much of them being made, the turquoise pieces being made into masks, what's the possibility that they were trading the softer stuff and using it as facial paint pigment? and yeah. matching their masks. Well, I'd say it's very high. There are turquoise pigments on murals in Mesoamerica. And in, the, in Pueblo Bonito, there are a number of objects that are painted with turquoise prayer sticks and other things that are, it's pretty clear that if we could see all the pigment there ever was, we'd be seeing a lot more turquoise. Yeah. I take that point and I think, or, or blue-green stones, whichever they are. Now, interestingly, the people in Oaxaca the Mishteks who made a lot of this stuff in the post-classic 1350 on, onward, um, they made these really incredibly elaborate, you know, a turquoise mosaic plaque showing 
a battle scene with people, priests and warriors wearing headdresses and people with their heads taken off and things, all on a little tiny tableau like this. Uh, this young man whose name I can't remember at uh, UNAM, uh, <laughs> uh, but you'll hear of him. He did some really interesting work with infrared light and other kinds of UV light uh, and was able to pick out uh, in a quick way how you can identify turquoise and distinguish it from other things, even though it doesn't come out strongly different in the, you know, visually. And, and he looked at one of those tableaus and all of the warriors are, tur are turquoise. And, and in the background around them is malachite or Chris Collier or something like that. So they're making that, you know, that distinction. They know how to sort that out. That they did what? They form at the same, same general place area. as where copper is, yes. No doubt that's not accidental. Another question? Right here. Hi. Janine Hernbrode has been leading a number of people in the Tucson area, exploring Sutherland Wash and the rock art there. Uh, she's been talking about it, it hasn't been published yet. Linking a lot of the imagery, flower and butterfly and bird imagery, to um, cultures in Mesoamerica where they were used as gathering places. And, and the, the rock art imagery here, for instance, on Signal Hill, um, has a processional and an amphitheater type thing, which is you know, another, perhaps, marker. Given the growing number of, of connections that seem to be happening, what do you think of Steve Lexon's theory that the Southwest and the Southeast were secondary Mesoamerican states? Well, in a way, I think that that's, that's a fair characterization. That, but again, this goes to sort of the teleconnection thing that, you know, there's there, not only in the Southwest, but all over North America, there is a rise of large regional centers. And there is a certain amount of connectivity amongst them, even uh, to the point of there being the same deities depicted on, on uh, southeastern shell gorgets that are depicted in the Huasteca region of, uh, of uh, northeastern Mexico, what is northeastern Mexico now. But again, that's a connection to a particular place. And I think when we have this all sorted out, we're going to find there are lots of people with distant connections, but many of those connections are leapfrogging lots of local worlds and going to some particular partner. And uh, I think that'll be an example of it. Uh, so I think that that's, uh, that statement, while interesting at one level, is also kind of an oversimplification. Well, Ben, thank you so very much. Thank you. <laughs>